A ty? No. <laughs> Thank you. I know. <laughs> There's two viewers, it's me and Jake. So, if that answers your question. <laughs> so, welcome everyone to the Green Ca Program Capstone Project. Um, congratulations to all you guys here. For everyone, anyone watching at home now or later, I'll just explain a little bit about what we've been doing for the last week. So, a week ago, all of these lovely people came to Iceland uh, to learn about sustainable energy and to experience it in real life. And all through these last uh, seven days of the trip, we've not only been hiking mountains, in the rain most of the time, being amazing, but also working on a capstone project to, s like, um, to solve real world problems that are uh, pressing today. So we have four groups that are going to present their projects. Um, and I'm excited to see what you guys have to offer. So the first group is Jade Technologies. Hey guys, um, so we are J Technology and we're going to be telling you a bit about the business automation system that we have with AI in uh, integration. Uh, my name is Eric Polanski. I am a student at the College of Lake County, planning on transferring to Northwestern University in the fall. Um, Hi, my name is Adam Hughes. Um, I'm a student at Lake College, uh, College, College of Lake County, um, and I plan to transfer to University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign in the fall. Then my name is DeAndre Ritchie. I'm a senior now at University of North Carolina in Wilmington, majoring in environmental science with a concentration in biological sciences. And I'm Josh Shear. I'm studying mechanical engineering at McGill University. All right, so now we're going to talk about our agenda, what we're going to be talking about today. Okay, to begin, we are going to start with the goal and circle, um, so the how, what, and why of our business, the sustainability complex, the sustainability development goals, what is building automation system, user interface, revenues and costs, and business model and the feasibility of our business. All right, so here's a quick rundown of our project with the golden circle. Um, the purpose or why of our system is essentially to reduce energy waste within buildings, uh, specifically businesses. Wasted energy contributes to high energy water and maintenance costs. It also results in more emissions due to buildings' reliance on fossil fuels. Um, currently, building managers have trouble getting specific data on their buildings and can't always make energy efficient changes without help. Um, so how do we plan on achieving this? We want to use sensors placed throughout buildings in order to collect data that we input into an AI system that creates suggestions for the building to become more energy efficient. Um, so what we are is a business that provides and installs our AI building automation system in businesses so that they can become more efficient. Um, so this slide touches on where we contribute within the sustainability complex. Uh, on the individual level, it helps building managers to make changes to create more energy efficient buildings. On the household level, it saves wasted energy in buildings and helps with green building certifications. And on the city level, it assists with sustainable building codes and making greener cities. Next, we got our sustainability development goals. Um, to start the industry and innovation, our, s our system will allow different industries to become more energy sustainable in their energy usage. So that'll be very innovational for these industries to be able to use our new technology to help innovate their usage. Um, next, our system will help sustainable cities and communities by making the buildings more energy efficient and cut down on the wasted energy that is used. 
And then responsible consumption, the system allows buildings to use less energy, which cuts down on the energy consumption. Okay, so what is a bu bu building automation system? So a building automation system is basically a network of uh, um, a centralized network system that le allows you to automate functions inside of a building. It includes like controlling temperatures, the lights, um, yeah. This is helpful because it allows the building managers to collect all the data in a centralized location, which allows them to calculate the energy being used and how much is being wasted in this specific room. Yeah, so um, now I'm kind of going to talk about the user interface, and this is really one of our biggest selling points that really pulls us away from other building automation systems that are out there. Um, so one of the things is the central hub. Um, I was talking to David hughes Moore, who's our sustainability manager at the College of Lake County, and he was saying as part of one of the things that he's had issues with is, you know, there's not really... Um, an easy way to access all that data and all that information uh, that you're able to use in order to um, really thrive and really um, have good information that's um, able to be applicable anywhere. Um, and so one of the things we thought is having a command center for all rooms at a single building or location. Um, it's very convenient and you're able to change uh, the temperature in the room from this one program. Um, another thing is an intuitive user interface with configurable dashboards and interactive reports. Um, inter uh, the interactive, like the interface is really something that we think is really important to be customizable so that whoever needs it um, can adapt to whatever they want or what the company wants uh, so that the, all the information is easy, easily accessible. Um, and then with the interactive reports, um, they can pull the data that they want to pull. If they want to see a certain, um, w a certain um, like wing of rooms and how much energy they're using comparing it to another room, they can do that. Um, there, there's a lot that can be done with this, uh, but making sure that it's interactive making sure that it's the data that the user wants. Um, next is the complete visibility and com uh, control over energy consumption. Uh, we want to make sure that all that information that we're able to collect is out there for that uh, user. We want, it, we want them to have everything that they need in order to uh, make sure that their sustain sustainability efforts are the best that they can be. Uh, so making sure that everything is there for them is one of the, pro uh, one of the things that we really want to hone in on. Um, and then a seamless integration with external systems and other devices. Um, I mean, this isn't really a system that works by itself. There's a lot of other things that can be done as well to help strengthen this, so, you know, having a holistic approach to it. Um, this, by this system that we have is great by itself, but with the addition of other programs, it can be even stronger, it can be, and it can be tailored to other um, com companies and buildings who may want to use this. Uh, the next thing is data m um, collection. Um, there, data collection is a big part of this, obviously, because that's really how we're going to get the information to us. Uh, so real-time monitoring and analysis is one of those things that we really want to hone in on. Uh, monitoring, as in uh, always being able to check everything at any time, uh, saying what uh, the temperature, are, temperature is in rooms and t saying what the energy usage is and stuff like that. So there's always real-time information and analysis as well, uh, so that if there are any anomalies or anything of that sort, um, it's able to detect that information. Uh, next is data uh, aggregation and processing, uh, making sure that the data is um, able to be comprehensible to the user um, in a meaningful way using advanced um, technical uh, like uh, data changes so that that raw data can be um, understood. Uh, next is historical data, um, really seeing what um, was done in the past, seeing what's done now, and being able to compare that stuff is something we think is really important because it shows the progress that's being made from the building or company that's using our system. Uh, so historical data uh, can check the seasons, it can check uh, times that um, usage is high, usage is low, um, and it could also help create benchmarks for future goals and energy usage. Um, Cloud-based storage is something that we want to use for data collection, uh, which basically means if you have Wi-Fi, um, you can, from anywhere, anytime, you can um, access that data. Um, it's not just um, stuck onto one computer. And data security and insight, making sure that the information that we do have is safe, protected, um, and won't be um, uh, hi hijacked. Uh, and then the next part is the AI recommendation part. And the AI recommendation is kind of one of the bigger uh, parts of the system. Um, because AI is becoming such an ever-emerging field, we thought that this would be beneficial to have in our um, pr 
project. And so um, we want to have an energy AI driven energy optimization suggestion um, software. And so it provides um, ideas on what a company or building can do in order to reduce the amount of energy that they have in any given room. Uh, for the AI, we plan on creating our own language model and creating it really from scratch as uh, current language models um, uh, don't have the best capacity to fill the need that we would be searching for with our AI. Um, for equipment scheduling and automation, um, the AI would be able to recognize uh, the best times uh, to change um, or to change equipment or automation uh, to help the system be stronger and um, replace the things that, that need to be replaced. And that kind of fits with predictive maintenance, um, seeing when uh, things are getting worse and um, having a proactive approach in uh, solving problems. Uh, and taking that step ahead, like this uh, uh, machine's about to die, maybe replace it or give it a new battery or something of that sort. Um, Occupancy-based control, um, being able to, being able to uh, see uh, when things are being used and using that information to uh, change the temperature. Same thing with weather, um, seeing what the temperature is outside and inside and uh, using that information to um, adapt to uh, what needs to be done in the room. Uh, and then there's fault de detection and diagnostics. So if there, a machine goes uh, awry for some reason, um, detect showing that to the user as well as um, t potentially having ideas on what's going wrong with the uh, system that's a little off. Um, and so next we'll talk a little bit about the revenues and the costs. So some costs to consider. Um, this is based off some information we found online depending on the unit and what it's able to track. Uh, so temperature sensors are about $70 per unit. Um, light sensors, door movement data trackers, and window movement data trackers are $25 per unit. Um, and for light sensors, that's the PIR sensors. Um, further, there's uh, research and development and overhead. Uh, those are really the big costs that we need to consider um, as those are the things that we need in order to collect the data and to strengthen our AI and to run operations. Uh, research and development is the biggest thing for us as um, that's what's gonna make the AI stronger, that's what's gonna have the user interface, that's what's gonna have the central hub, the data collection. So research and development and making sure that we're stronger and better for the future is, is the key priority in all of this so that um, things work um, very efficiently and very adequately. Um, and then for our revenue streams, we have um, our upfront installation costs, our subscription fee, our warranty fee, and our maintenance cost. Um, those are pretty self-explanatory, um, but those are just the ways that we would be able to create revenue um, that we can put directly back into the business. And then here's an over, overview of our BA system business model. So our business model, it's mainly an overview of what's already been said before. I know there's a lot of bullet points up there, so I'll just be going through some of the few specifics that help the business the most. And then afterwards, if there are questions on it, we can bring it back up so we can get more specifically. So some of the key, um, with key partners, obviously investors are really one, probably one of the most important things. Also trying to get the IT system, you definitely need people who are really going to be ha used and have the knowledge in order to build this IT system and then going with the type of um, interventions and that we have are the sensors and the data pub that's kind of the other main component with our business that's really going to be needed and that's really going to be implemented with this and then as Eric just said we have our revenue streams which are when we're selling the sensors and also the, the subscription fee that we have with this type of business and then when talking about different channels and how we're going to be able to um, broadcast this more. A lot of what we were talking about were webinars and also just different brand marketings in order to not only explain how people can use this, but then also explain why it's important for these businesses to incorporate this within themselves. And then um, one of the other just very important things with this business within value proposition would just be energy efficiency. Um, in the end, we really want to have a direct impact on that while also helping other companies with their energy efficiency, within, which then goes into their cost savings and also cost reductions. 
which leads into our feasibility. So feasibility for this company, it's very gray overall. It's not just a yes or no. There's a lot of different components that go into this that m can make it work really well or make it have some gaps. And some of the measurements that we found with feasibility were, are you able to get enough investors? Do you have people who specialize in IT? And are you able to find a manufacturer who's gonna be able to make these sensors and everything? And would investors be able to invite, provide experience workers and with those questions it makes it really like a, if you're able to really get all these things it can run really smoothly but if you're missing some of these key components it might not work as well considering how complex not only the AI system is but then also tracking the energy within each system that people buy and then when companies come in to do a subscription there's just a lot of numbers that need to be ran so you definitely would need not only the investors backing it up but the people who work for you being very skilled in that as well. And then that is it. So I guess we're on the questions. Thank you so much for listening to us today. Great. Thank you guys so much for the great presentation. Um, I have some questions. I have a question I'll start off with, and then I'll have one from Jake at the university, and then anyone else who's... Uh, wants to ask questions. So my first question is, it seems like there's a lot of work that is made with your project. So would you have to, would the companies have to hire like another business or building manager to do that? And if so, would it be cost eff effective? Like would they save enough money with your systems um, to justify hiring someone to analyze all of this uh, information that you guys will be, prov be providing? Um, well, I'll, I'll take the question. Um, <clears throat> it really depends on the company, and it depends on where they're at right now. Um, a lot of companies do have someone who, um, or a group of people, like facilities that um, manage the building and take care of it. And we're mostly working with businesses on this. It's not uh, more so um, standalone buildings. And most of them do have business managers that are able to use that information. Um, but I would argue no, because it would be um, a user interface that's fairly simple to understand um, and information that a company can just, you know, if they there's going to be some preset um, reports if they want it and they can look at that information um, and see it. it. It shouldn't be something where it sh um, they'd have to hire a brand new person to oversee this entire operation as that would be quite costly, I'd say. I have a, another two questions from Jake. So the first one is, what motiv you, motivated you to work on building an automation system with an AI integration? I guess it's the same question. Um, I know there are similar products out there that don't use AI. Like, what does your competition look like and what makes you better? Um, I think the first question, so I think what motivated us to really do an AI system was, when we were like discussing, you know, the different ideas and I heard Eric talk about AI, that really, I guess like I was really motivated because AI, it's a very fast growing thing, especially like now we see it used a lot. And I think being able to incorporate it throughout all types of businesses and all different like types of, I guess, like topics, which is really interesting. And I think that's what really motivated us to be like, well, how can we integrate it into what we're doing now, especially since some of us have like really different majors. We were really trying to find something that incorporates all of this, like Eric, he's computer science and I'm environmental science. That's like two different things. So being able to put this AI system and say, well, this is an AI system that incorporates environmental, you know, sciences like as a scope was just really like a big motivation factor. And then, yeah, that's kind of like why we were motivated. And then when talking about competition, um, I mean, I just think that our product would just like be better in a sense because I think it's more so just like a simplified view. One, if it was able to be made, be more so like a simplified view of how companies can not only be more energy efficient, but then also how they could probably change some of their production of how they're doing things in order to not not only save money, but then also like help the environment as well. When looking at different other AI systems, I didn't really see, I guess, any other AI systems who were trying to, you know, utilize database from different companies in order to say, make this product or say, well, this product would work better. So I think that ours would be like, I would say one of its kind and really would just, be very different and I think 
a lot of different companies could use it, not just like one company within itself or one just like area. I think there are a lot of different areas that can be used, such as here in Midgard, they could use it. Like it's very vast and broad. And uh, next up is Beep V. We'll go ahead and get started. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for being here with us. We're uh, going to present our green program capstone presentation. We'll introduce ourselves real quick. My name is Jesse Garduno. I'm Sean Ramos. I'm Lindsay Savage. And Autumn Silvestri. So we have created a company called Bio <laughs> Biofiltration Enhancement of Existing Photovoltaics, or BEEP-V for short, which would install uh, biofiltering plants underneath existing solar arrays in order to provide benefits to the environment and the solar panels themselves. So a ground-mounted solar panel is a panel that isn't mounted on a rooftop or on a building, but directly in the field itself. So currently in the United States, it's estimated we have about 15,000 square kilometers of currently installed or in the works ground-mounted photovoltaic projects. To visualize how large this area is, if you think about all the glaciers that we've walked on or passed by in the few past few days, uh, the sum cumulative total of all of their areas is about 11,400 square kilometers. So this amount of land being used uh, is in excess of that and is primarily located in rural watershed areas within the United States. So why is this a problem? It's because the land under and around them is usually underutilized. What they do to prepare the ground for a ground-mounted <laughs> panel installation is that they first grade the land, which is a type of leveling. And according to the Department of Energy, this leveling process makes the soil very susceptible to erosion. So what they do to combat this currently is that they plant grass. And grass requires intensive periodic mowing, requires intensive water investment. And it also is to the detriment of local biodiversity because it doesn't provide the habitats for local insects and pollinators. So this is a bit of an issue because we are producing energy in this renewable way, but to the detriment of the land and the community around it. So how can we fix this problem? This is the why of our project. In our research, we found that uh, targeted plantings beneath solar panels can actually increase their efficiency. So using this as our premise, we want to make, uh, we want to fully utilize the land so that solar energy is more sustainable as a whole. Yeah, so it, it's because of this issue of these underutilized areas of lands that our organization has a mission to uh, connect some of these really important solar energy companies to the local communities, and uh, most importantly, to address some of the uh, gaps in the energy production that we have. So um, we've been doing a lot of research into some of the methods that we can be using to fill those gaps. Our focus will uh, primarily be to find some of the areas with these solar panels and develop a plan with the owners and the installers to remodel the installations with uh, biofiltering solutions. So we'll be looking to into combining the uses of the solar energy panels and the uh, bioswales, which we'll go into right now. Um, the bioswales are essentially a linear vegetated channel, which allows for the collection, the uh, filtration and infiltration of uh, stormwater. The primary benefits of these bioswales are the, uh, the treatment of stormwater, they assist with uh, pollutant removal, and additionally, the uh, added green space uh, could be used to provide habitat for some of the uh, wild species, which is really important for the uh, biodiversity in some of these areas. So within our project, we'll be uh, looking to insert some of the uh, plant species within the channel of the bioswale, and then we'll also be using those to uh, situate them underneath these solar panels. So within this diagram, you can see that uh, we can actually adjust the solar panel heights, and we'll be utilizing these heights uh, essentially to select some plant life most suitable for that environment and also the locations that they're in. 
So the combination of the solar panels and the bioswales will be really important for um, the transpiration or otherwise uh, cooling of the solar panels, which will improve the efficiency of their uses. Um, the bioswales being situated underneath those solar panels will also lead to um, reduced erosion and it will also improve the, uh, the water quality as well. So as we see on the slide, we have an overview of our business model, ranging from the segments, the key resources, partner stakeholders, as well as the cost analysis. So I'll hand it off to Autumn, who will start off with talking about the beneficiaries and customers for our solution. Okay, so who are we targeting with our um, nonprofit? First of all, it's the owners of the solar panels arrays and the land on which it's situated, especially if those two are different owners, whether they're governmental or private. Uh, they will be receiving the main benefit of additional energy production because of the cooling of the panels by the plants beneath them. The local communities and cities, though, in the vicinity of these grounded photovoltaic arrays will also benefit from increased water quality and the increased biodiversity and diminished erosion. Local installers of these biofiltration systems will benefit. They'll have the additional contracts that we provide by connecting them with the owners. The type of intervention we visualized ourselves serving as the um, nonprofit is the consulting and design of the biofiltration system itself. It will have to be on a case by case basis by evaluating the scale and the scope of the photovoltaic array, how the bioswales will be oriented between the panels, and exactly what type of native plantings we'll have to use so that they come up beneath the height of the solar panels, they don't block them, but they also provide enough of a transpiration benefit that um, the panels are cooled adequately. So these values in summary are, number one, the increased solar panel efficiency, and then the additional benefits of stabilizing the soil with minimal erosion, removing toxins from the water runoff in the area, and providing those habitats for local insects and pollinators. Beep Fee runs largely on the connections between us and our partners and key stakeholders, as well as the technicians and the contractors that we would be working with to put our plans into place. So once we get into contact with the owners and suppliers of the solar arrays, we will facilitate the planning and selection of the biofiltering plants on a case-by-case -case basis, as was mentioned, depending on the needs of the area and the unique height and climate of wherever we are working. Um, and then throughout the process, we will be forming these connections, which you can rely on in future uh, projects with BPV and uh, creating more sustainable bioswales in other arrays. And we will be uh, spreading awareness of our services through word of mouth, social media presence, and um, uh, educational outreach events regarding the benefits of our biofiltration integration. Thanks, Lindsay. So now from a cost perspective, um, so our biggest expenditures will be from installation and maintenance costs. Uh, so installation and maintenance costs, those encapsulate um, personnel time, so for our cons consulting time, as well as any materials, so the plants that we're purchasing for our bioswell solutions. So according to the uh, published article in the Journal of Environmental Engineering, they did a study of seven different low-impact development stormwater management systems and kept track of um, the maintenance and initial insulation costs over four years. And they found that the insulation cost for vegetated swale was $37,750 US dollars per hectare. And then maintenance overall on average per year was $4,600 per hectare per year. And that also in, um, includes the consideration of the time value of money. Uh, so an example of some activities included in maintenance include debris checking for debris accumulation, visual inspection of erosion, as well as looking for newly established plants within the bioswales. Uh, so for marketing, uh, as Lindsay mentioned, we'll not be spending a lot to start. Instead, we'll be relying on our network and our social media presence in order to get those initial contracts. But then we'll be working with the local communities and building those relationships to further land future projects. Uh, so for our impact measures, um, as Autumn mentioned before, uh, the implementation of plants beneath solar panels has shown to improve the energy efficiency of the solar panels. So for example, um, from a study from the National Renewable Energy Laboratory in 2017. They're able to show through the use of crops and plants underneath solar panels, 
would cool down the solar panels up to 9.1 degrees Celsius throughout the year, and that resulted in up to a 3% increase in efficiency for the solar panels. Um, so this would result in up to $42,000 worth of energy production savings over 30 years, which is the average lifespan for solar panels as well as bioswales. So convenient that they're around the same lifespan. Um, so now this might not seem like a large cost savings relative to the insulation costs and maintenance costs as seen in, in the previous slide. However, um, another way to quantify the non-profitable benefits of our solution is through looking at nearby property values. So according to the, or according to the uh, Center for Neighborhood Technology, they were able to show that the implementation of bioswales uh, around surrounding housing neighborhoods improved the housing costs or housing values by 2.8%, which would uh, encapsulate all those non-profitable benefits of the improved water quality, uh, biodiversity, and, um, and, and improved uh, energy efficiency. Um, so moving on into our revenue sources and surplus. So our main uh, revenue source will be the consulting fees that we'll be charging uh, the owners of these solar array installations. Um, so that will encompass about 75% of our revenue. And then we'll also be looking to apply for relevant sustainability grants to help keep our nonprofit organization afloat. So for example, the Alameda County Community Stewardship Grants, um, which protect local watersheds, we'll be applying for um, grants like that, as well as um, the Rural Energy for America program, Renewable Systems, and then also be taking donations. So our profits will be reinvested into research and development plans to further develop our bioswales to improve the energy efficiencies of these solar panels, as well as into educational workshops to build those connections with the local community and um, educate everyone on sustainable practices as they relate to solar panels and bioswales. So we've went over a lot of the specifics uh, regarding our project, so we wanted to provide a uh, very quick sample project timeline. So one of the first initial steps in this is to locate some of those target uh, ground-mounted PV sites for the uh, solar panels. And then we also need to establish contact with the uh, landowner and uh, solar array owners um, just to develop a plan to remodel the installation. Next, we then evaluate the site for its feasibility, and then we design the specific measures that we would take at that location, the native plant species, and the arrangement of the bioswales themselves. At that point, we'll contact local installers to develop cost estimates for the owners of the land and the solar arrays. After that is putting our plan into place by contacting local um, installers in order to actually put what we've designed into uh, place and then maintaining periodic interactions in order to ensure the proper maintenance that is needed for both the bioswales and the solar arrays. Yeah, from there, we'll monitor and evaluate our systems based off of the previously discussed impact measure. So the energy efficiency improvements as well as the um, surrounding property values of our solutions. And then from there, we'll be able to experience increased solar energy, water purity, and local biodiversity. With the adaptability of our plans, we are able to uh, accommodate a large range of benefits from the regional benefits to the community benefits, depending on where and what the solar array that we are working with is. Uh, so we have a bunch of sustainability development goals that are uh, going to be put into place through this, uh, through our plans. And so the first ones that we were focusing on is the clean water and sanitation and life below water. With the biofiltering plants, we are reducing the amount of toxins in the runoff, providing cleaner ecosystems of the water around the uh, arrays. By contributing to the sustainable infrastructure of solar panel installations, we are contributing to goals seven and nine of affordable and clean energy and industry innovation and infrastructure, such that the land will be fully utilized for multiple purposes, stormwater runoff purification and provision of local habitats for um, native species, as well as producing energy more efficiently. 
And then for goals 13 and 15, climate action and life on land, our use of a, a multifunction approach to the utilization of uh, solar panels and bioswales is really important towards our goals. Um, through our project, we'll be able to preserve the environmental health for the uh, communities that we're working with. And through our project, we'll also be able to uh, protect and restore some of the uh, conditions of the local terrestrial ecosystems. Um, also, uh, combat desertification, fixing carbon, and uh, halting land degradation and uh, biodiversity loss. In all, we're confident that with this strategy that we can fully utilize the land underneath the solar mounted arrays and thus continue producing sustainable energy through ground mounted solar panels in a more, more whole rounded perspective. That brings us to the end of our presentation. Thank you all for listening. Our contact information is shown on the slide if you have some questions after the Q&A period. But uh, with that, that wraps up our presentation and we'll take any questions that you may have. Are there any uh, future funding sources that you would be able to tap into to help you uh, do this someday? Uh, so I don't have any specifics right now, but I know there are um, a lot of available grants related to uh, protecting water resources as well as improving efficiency of um, renewable energy sources. So. Uh, the one that I mentioned, actually, the Rural Energy for America program, uh, Renewable Systems, that's an ongoing one, um, ongoing grant, and I think they supply up to $500,000 um, U.S. dollars for improving efficiency of solar panel systems. So. Any other questions? <laughs> Congratulations on the amazing presentation. Um, so from Jake at the university, he says this project is very impressive and very well put together. Congratulations. Uh, and it touched upon all of the areas, the business model canvas, and a great idea. Um, his question is, how common are solar plants with biofiltration enhancements in practice today? So they aren't overly common at the moment. We actually, just this January, a study was published on a modeling water flow of stormwater on uh, ground-mounted solar panel arrays. So best practices are currently being developed right now. It's very, it's a newer concept. Another way that they're implemented instead of using filtration plants is with um, using agricultural plants beneath the um, ground-mounted solar panels. However, those designs are a little bit different because usually um, the farm will work with the solar panel installers in the first place so they can make a design that's relatively taller um, that they can fit their grazing animals beneath, which would help with their maintenance and upkeep. But in the case of the previously existing solar panels that they are usually lower mounted on the soil and all they're using is grass typically in that 15,000 square. Um, square kilometers of land because they wanted to keep their costs down, I suppose, with with those installations. So this biofiltration solution is not common at all. Oh, thank you. Um, I have two questions and maybe you just answered it, but uh, I didn't hear it. So uh, is there any issue with lack of light because of the solar panels um, and the ecosystem below? Um, and then I'll so short answer is no. Um, this was actually a really interesting question because the wavelengths of light that plants use for their photosynthesis is not necessarily the same as the one that the solar panel is using. But to completely avoid that issue in the first place, uh, you can use species of specifically shade-loving plants, and they use a separate they use a lower intensity of light that would pass through the solar panels in the first place. So one of the considerations that we would have to make when we're designing the bioswales is not only um, just native plants to the region, but also ones that are shade loving. And that is not very difficult at all because within any understory of a forest, you can find several types of species that are doing this actively in nature already.
guess where Oh, oh. Where are you guys gonna feed it? That's what I was wondering. Oh. [noise] You can ask Phil. Mm, is there any problem with like the breed for like you like following or um like breeding? Like for this breed or that like that? Do you know what you're looking for for a mate? Yeah, I'm I'm just gonna feed that the question was uh if there's any debris or like waste um that would get um become a problem with the solar panels. Yeah. We also looked into this as well. Because we wanted to make sure that the maintenance that we would have to do wouldn't be in excess of the maintenance they were already doing for the solar panels, and apparently the way they install the slanted ground-mounted panels is it allows rainfall to flow down them which takes care of most dust and debris. And then they check in on the solar panels I think a maximum of about four times a year to clean off anything else, but that would, they would already be doing that with their array. So we don't expect it to increase their maintenance costs at all. Yeah, so uh to build on that, uh that research paper on the like seven different types of low-impact development stormwater management systems, they also touched on um the effect the efficacy of debris removal for each of the systems. So the most similar one to our solution would be vegetated swale and they were looking at around 60% removal of like any waste or just like debris going around. Um and then across the whole year the average per hectare was about 24 hours of maintenance, so nothing crazy. Any further questions? <laughs> Thank you. And next up we have Aquaponics Anywhere. Hello everyone, I am Steve Miller. I'm Brody Roundtree. I'm Jesse James Escutia. And we're here to tell you a little bit about our company, Aquaponics Anywhere. So to begin with, why do we even exist? Uh, <laughs> Aquaponics Anywhere is uh, addressing the issue of food accessibility, uh, specifically, or both globally and locally. And we are doing that by synergizing uh, green energy and energy saving technology uh, to make the process of aquaponics farming uh, viable anywhere. And the goal of this is to create a nonprofit that will sell vegetables, shrimp, and other marine life, uh, as well as self contained uh, installations uh, for existing institutions that want to begin that practice. So in terms of the sustainability complex, uh, the interventions that we are uh, proposing and why, uh, globally, uh, the, de the demand for seafood is skyrocketing. Uh, it's bound to go from 100 to 170 tons uh, by 2030. And presently, most of the world's fisheries are at or beyond their production capacity. And when a fishery goes beyond its production capacity, you risk uh, ecological collapse of the ocean. Uh, which has already happened in large areas of the Mediterranean and the North Seas. Uh, we are also facing global warming, uh, which is affecting the, both the quality and the quantity of available seafood. Uh, nationally, uh, in the USA, we import the vast majority of our seafood. Uh, shrimp, for instance, uh, we import 96% of our shrimp. Uh, of that 96%, less than 2% is inspected. 60% uh, of that 2% is rejected. Uh, it is full of antibiotics, viruses, uh, parasites, and is frequently of just inferior quality. And furthermore, shipping a one pound bag of that shrimp uh, from Asia, where it is typically harvested, to the US uh, produces one ton of carbon dioxide. Further down on the local level, uh, there are over 6,500 uh, what are called food deserts uh, in the US. These are places where nutritious uh, access to nutritious food is very difficult or impossible uh, for the local community. And we are intervening there, uh, specifically targeting areas within one day of our business so that our products will be fresh. And uh, promoting locavorism, which put simply is like the benefits associated with eating food that is produced 
uh, locally to your environment. And finally, on the individual level, uh, we are aimed to improve uh, nutrition by offering nutritious food and food sovereignty by offering a variety of food options to people. So I mentioned aquaponics. Uh, if you're not familiar with uh, the process of aquaponics, it is the combination of what is called aquaculture, which is the farming of fish and other seafood, uh, with hydroponics, which is growing plants uh, in a soil-free medium, uh, often just in water. And the way an aquaponics system works is the fish uh, provide the fertilizer for the plants uh, in the form of nitrogen and the plants filter out uh, the ammonia products that the fish produce, and they live in sort of a happy cycle helping each other out like that. Um, our system would be what's called an intensive system, uh, which is self-contained indoors, uh, which allows us to control all of the inputs and outputs of the system, and also take advantage of these synergistic uh, green energy saving technologies, such as geothermal hydro panel systems, solar systems, and uh, reclaiming uh, fresh water. And now there are other enterprises that have done things sort of in this field, uh, but not exactly. Um, so some, such as Whispering Roots, uh, they have begun aquaponics operations for, like focusing on underserved communities. Uh, others like Fish and Greens, uh, they are focusing more on the uh, green technology and sustainable uh, tech. Uh, aquaponics in general, is a growing uh, field. There's about 13% annual growth globally. Uh, it is also exploding in inland areas in the, uh, the United States. So, I mean, even in the Midwest, uh, we still, despite a lot of aquaponics companies moving in, uh, we still produce uh, less than 1% of our own seafood consumption. Uh, but how we distinguish ourselves from those companies is that we are focusing on marine aquaponics. Uh, so specifically salt water uh, fish and what are called halophytes or salt tolerant plants. And that would allow us to, um, the use of our green technology allows us to locate those uh, operations uh, further from the ocean and uh, regardless of climate. Now I'll hand this over to Brody. Yeah, and aquaponics have a lot of environmental benefits. Uh, first of all, these systems do not require pesticides or other, or other substances to support life. Um, and also, the integrated system use each other's waste. That was why using um, aquaculture and hydroponics is so beneficial. And this can be either pitched as a store or as a standalone hydroponics install. The system can be designed to fit any space and size, making it easy to install in different setups. Seafood and lettuce travels fewer food miles, increasing freshness, and decreasing transport carbon emission. This is especially important um, in the Midwest. All three of us are from Illinois. And um, food, if it's shipped in from, say, California to Illinois, can travel over 2,000 miles. Um, and food traveling locally within a day reduces carbon emission. Also, it doesn't require that much soil. We visited a tomato restaurant, and they use hydroponics, and one small box of soil can support five plants, tomato plants, for their lifetime of nine months. Uh, for the building that we're creating the store in, we'd be using all renewable energy and um, water, and we're using hydro panels to provide energy and water for our building. This is on, in order to keep our building sustainable. Hydro panels turn air moisture into liquid water usable for our building. These are typically used in the desert, but would be even more efficient if used in humid Chicago by our lake. These would be south facing to capture maximum sunlight usage, and the leading brand source provides commercial hydro panels that can be configured to any water demand, and we will also collect rainwater to supplement. And that's a diagram of how they work. They use moisture from the air and solar energy to condense the water out of it and turn it into water that you can use. Our building would also be all geothermally heated in order to add to our sustainability. Yeah, um, This means storing water underground at different temperatures, different times of year, and air conditioning heat the store depending on the season and time of day. 
We will also fit an attachment called a desuperheater, which, according to energy.gov, assists in the summer cooling period. The heat removed from the house is used to heat the water for free. In the winter, water heating costs are reduced by about 50%. And that geothermal can reduce emissions and energy usage up to 72% compared with electric resistance heating and standard air conditioning. Um, our store would also have a lot of educational benefits. Our store would provide field trips for schools to teach kids in the area about the importance of healthy food, how aquaponics work, and sustainability, and renewable energy. Our aquaponic system could also be installed in a school to provide fresh food for school lunches. Um, our organization also helps a lot of the sustainable development goals. Um, our organization helps solve number two, zero hunger, by providing sex accessible, cost-friendly, and nutritious food to areas where such items were previous to far or expensive, like food deserts. Our organization contributes to sustainable cities and communities by using sustainable practices with clean energy, conserving water, waste, and contributing positively back to the community. Also, our organization shifts demand from for seafood from unsustainable fishery practices towards aquaponics and paves the way for further aquaponic development. We would provide information and teachings about sustainability, healthy food choices, clean energy cooking classes, and school group trips for number four. And our organization provides jobs for the local community. And this is our social business model canvas. A lot of these uh, we've already talked about a bit, but um, stuff like partners and key stakeholders, we would need to partner with city officials for outreach and investors to help with setup costs. And as a review of our key activities, we will be building a building where plants, seafood, and other food are grown and then sold directly to people, or an aquaponics install, and we will also provide tours and education to school trips to teach people the importance of healthy food. Also, for channels, our main channel is in-store pickup, but we're also considering in the future short-distance delivery uh, to people who cannot afford transit using zero-emission vehicles in the future. And this uh, right here is just some sample numbers uh, representing uh, the first year cost and revenue of setting up uh, such a facility. And all of the figures in green uh, represent our startup costs, uh, which are one-time costs, uh, includes uh, the installation of production tanks, uh, the geothermal and hydro panel systems, uh, as well as the larva to begin um, production of shrimp. And those are expensive, which is one of the uh, challenges facing this operation is securing that initial funding. Uh, the lighter green uh, costs uh, represent uh, expenditures that could come down over time uh, as our synergistic systems go into effect. So we, the shrimp, we don't always have to keep purchasing as young larvae, but they could be grown and hatched in our facility. Uh, the triple um, net, uh, the $20,000 there for our utilities, electricity, and maintenance cost would come down as we are not as reliant on the energy grid. And those tanks, uh, so 12 800-gallon shrimp production tanks uh, would produce about $200,000 in revenue uh, over the course of a year. So while that would not make the facility profitable in its first year, uh, going forward, um, it would. And so other strengths of our facility are the crop flexibility. You don't necessarily have to stick with shrimp uh, if another food source is more needed um, in that environment. Uh, same with the associated vegetables. And uh, the system is fully modular and uh, scalable. So you could add more tanks uh, or less depending on the space and the size of your community. I'll hand it to Jesse. Okay. So I took inspiration of this famous symbol that we all know about. And that's kind of what my building was influenced around. Uh, I was also trying to tag the LEED program with my building, or our building. Um, <laughs> so you'll, you'll see later on through the renders how that was implemented. Uh, so there's an aerial exterior view of it. As you guys can see, we have our ADA parking, our bicycle racks to attack the lead program at it. And it also lets us have a 
the electrical electrical charging stations as you can see in these areas so we're also trying to promote more uh, car efficient vehicles in this area by reducing the ones with carbon emission then you can also see one that's in the floor area by the going to the entrance of it and also the trees which can actually add also a biodiversity to the area so for birds squirrels any and native animals from the area can home themselves there. Uh, this is kind of a, a rough blueprint of how it's supposed to look like. As you guys can see, that's the main entrance. It has its stairs and elevator to the second floor, which this elevator would be for ADA as well. We have the three wings that would be our aquaponic areas with its conference room in the center for the school field trips and all that. And then we would have our bathrooms on each side, our storage room, and a main office. In the second floor, you can kind of see the symbol, how it looks a lot more prominent now. And with its dining area being in the second floor, so you can dine in, dine in the place. Uh, the, our entrance for it. Then this would be a detailed example of our wall systems. Uh, the green walls function as ins insulation, so during the summer we would be reducing the, c the cooling and during the winter we would be reducing the heating. So it actually helps also the HVAC system for geothermal to not work as hard to make up for that. Uh, second one would be the Sika roof and floor systems. For our floor systems we are using an epoxy floor system which is actually uh, environmentally friendly by reducing less uh, carbon emissions. And then we have a Sika roofing system, which would be for our solar panels. Uh, here's a picture of our conference room, which can be also used for the school field trips to showcase how we function as a company. Uh, the aquaponics lab with the blue panels on the top, those would be our hydro panels, which suck in the moisture from the air and put it back into the pools or even for the green walls, which they're in the inside and the outside to also help reduce the moisture. Uh, th this the next one is the dining area in the second place. This one, I just did it in the, the Joaquin Beach area. So in the background, that would be your beach so you can be dining with your seafood and have the beach in the background. Any questions? Thank you for the great presentation. Um, I have a question um, about, I didn't fully understand the powering of it. Are you partnering with like people producing power? Uh, and if so, does that affect uh, the location that you're choosing? Because I know you're trying to address these food deserts. So does that give you any constraints or issues there? Thank you. Yeah. Our focus is, while we would still, for instance, uh, in our prototype facility, require access to um, the energy grid, uh, all of our systems are like energy saving, and they are like um, internal to our facility. So our uh, geothermal heating system and our solar panels would be like um, providing power and energy savings to, to us. So we would still require like access to the city grid. Mm -hmm. So congratulations fr oh, from Jake. <laughs> um, his question is, why were you motivated to create this project and do you see potentials for this in your local communities? Sure. Um, well, food deserts, there are, we all live in suburban Illinois and some areas can have less access to fresh food. Um, than others, and it'd be really nice to implement that nearby in um, Chicago. Yeah. Right. 
Uh, congratulations on a great presentation. Uh, good information. Uh, I have a question about like startup funding. It sounds like once you get the ball rolling, you'll be able to uh, sell some high value items that'll help repay some of the debt. But how do you get the start off uh, funding? What, what kind of strategies do you have? Thank you. Yeah, a as a nonprofit uh, that is like very tightly integrated into specific local communities, uh, we would definitely be looking to municipal uh, governments, uh, state governments, uh, partnership with uh, local school systems. Uh, we do want to be like a source of education, uh, both on terms of sustainability and the value of like fresh uh, and healthy, nutritious food and how to prepare it. So yeah, we would reach out to schools. Uh, local government, state governments, uh, absolutely. Yeah. Great presentation. And um, last but not least is <laughs> Iwaska. What? Iwesk. Oh, I don't know. Yeah, Iwesk. <laughs> All right. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Jack Cagino. I am a rising senior at Miami University, double majoring in geology and environmental science with a focus in molecular biology. Uh, I'm Jamie Doran. I am just a fire science major at CLC. Hello, my name is Matteo Perlo. I'm a rising sophomore at Carnegie Mellon University with a major in environmental engineering, double major in engineering and public policy. And we are IWESC. <laughs> and IWESC is um, dedicated to implementing wave energy in small communities. All right. So as we all know, Climate change sucks, and one of the big things that a problem is that many people don't talk about right off the bat is coastal areas that are being affected by seawater increase um, due to storms and just intensity. Oh, sorry, also, fun weekend, so and don't mind my voice. <laughs> but um, anyway, so this deterioration of coastal areas can greatly impact the accessibility that these coastal areas have um, to get this energy. And um, for extended periods of times, and a lot of it is outages for weeks. Um, and right now, we want to tackle that issue. Um, so first, why? Once again, um, coastal communities are being affected by climate change and experiencing outages. And we would like to provide more reliable energy and increase their accessibility to energy. How are we going to do this? So we are going to integrate renewable energy technologies, such as wave energy into small communities that have less reliable access to renewable energy sources. And what? We're gonna create a list of priority communities to supply this future energy types of sources with, and one of the examples is wave energy. Okay, so I'm just gonna outline our process really quick. So um, our process, first we are going to identify a bunch of small coastal communities that are experiencing energy insecurity. And then we will rank those communities according to their need and potential for like how easy it is to implement renewable energy, such as wave energy, in those communities. Um, so that is the pr our process of making our priority list. Once we have our priority list, we will select a high priority community and then research how to supply them with energy such as wave energy. And as part of that process, we will talk with local community members and see which directions they see us taking their community and which energy sources they want to implement. Um, after we come up with a plan for implementing energy, we will contact the relevant energy companies and incentivize them to provide energy to these communities. So for our sustainability complex, we're mostly for the, at least the start, focused on the, mainly the community level, which will provide accessible and affordable energy for small communities. Um, however, as our company grows, we would be focused also on the global scale as we target communities all over the globe that are ha experiencing energy insecurity and provide them with renewable energy. 
Okay, so some of our key activities um, were discussed earlier, but just in general, it's um, creating a priority list and then going to top priority communities and figuring out how to best implement energy in those communities. Um, partnering with us, we require the governments of these small communities, as well as the community members and the current developers of renewable energy. Uh, key resources that we would need are volunteers to essentially supply us with um, communities of interest that they're interested in, as well as some starter research. And then we would have um, our hired data analysts go through that research and collect more in order to create the priority list. Um, as part of that research, um, search engines, open AI, and community databases could help collect and um, interpret information. Um, we are mainly benefiting coastal communities with this project uh, by providing them with renewable energy. And as um, we will also, our customers would be the local community government, which would provide us with like some sort of subsidies if they're looking to bring renewable energy in, as well as patrons. We are mainly providing a research service, so mainly we are looking to collect and put together research so that energy companies can see where their energies would most likely be used. Um, our channels are social media, a website that would serve as a interface between the volunteers and the data analysts, as well as word of mouth and advertisement campaigns. And we'll measure value through the number of communities helped, the amount of energy saved and provided, as well as local jobs created through the energy power plant production and um, construction and maintenance. Um, our, our main costs are gonna be um, paying um, energy companies to incentivize them, and that will just basically be done with whatever funds we have left over from co like the cost of just paying employees to collect the research. Um, we will be a nonprofit, but our revenue streams are just like donations as well as government subsidies, and any surplus will just be used to research more communities and um, incentivize more companies. So yeah, I'm just gonna go through some more of the, sp the specifics of how this, like how we, uh, our idea of like how we actually generate energy for these smaller coastal communities. So wave energy is one of the cur uh, currently one of the world's largest untapped source of energy. With uh, the proper infrastructure and technology, it could be it, the it could potentially be a source of energy, um, or one of the largest source of energies for our seas. It works very well in tandem with uh, other renewables such as wind and solar, which I'll go into in a bit. And it's a clean, effective uh, alternative to fossil fuel and nuclear fission because it doesn't produce any waste and it doesn't use any. Um, fossil fuels. Ideally, we would be using wave energy to power larger communities all over the world, but we're starting with smaller um, coastal communities because it makes the most sense and it requires the least, of our, we, can, it, we have the technology and development um, to implement it. Most coastal communities today are still entirely reliant on fossil fuels or for consistent energy production while having access to one of the most flexible and reliable sources of energy um, available today, like the ocean. Many coastal communities have strong winds, which are a great supplement to wind energy as the waves produced by the wind continue long after the wind has died down. Uh, just that's just because the wind is, uh, creates part of like the wind and uh, these poor coastal communities would be given a new industry to provide jobs. Um, the power outages caused by the harsh weather in many coastal communities could still rely on diesel fuel, or they still rely on diesel fueled backup generators to power uh, their houses during and after storms. So uh, with wave energy, we could be providing these um, coastal communities uh, access to a di their own power grid, as well as uh, kind of taking away the need for these uh, personal generators that are also being used uh, by for with uh, diesel and fossil fuels. So one of the main technologies that we're excited about being implemented is wave piston. Uh, it's a, a new way of harvesting wave energy uh, these energy collectors push water through a pipe that connects to a turbine. Uh, the w motion of the waves uh, pushes this water, which is exasperated by the wind, uh, which can also be harvested. Uh, this can be used for both electricity and fresh water generation through the use of reverse osmosis. Uh, 
And here's a kind of an example of like how our organization would work um, by analyzing the data. Like you can see on this map, uh, southern Iceland uh, has better access to waves, and these are there's a few communities. You might remember the Westman Islands, where we passed, drove past, and was were introduced to that one uh, smaller community that still uses uh, fossil fuels with uh, personal generators. So with the uh, implementation of wave technology, they wouldn't have to be so reliant on um, fossil fuels, and we could make Iceland uh, entirely um, renewable and sustainable. So uh, we using this just as a case study, this is kind of what our company would be doing all around the globe. We'd be looking at these smaller communities, um, communities' reliance on power backup generators for um, harsh weather uh, because they get caught off from the power grid or like sor storms or uh, um, anything that could uh, hinder their ability to have power. Conclusions. <laughs> All right, so what is our, what is IWESC committed to? So we have a bunch of sustainable development goals, but our main one obviously is affordable and clean energy along with sustainable cities and communities. But furthermore, what Jamie said, clean water and sanitation through the process of reverse osmosis to desalinate the water where we can provide fresh water to those communities who don't have access to it already. And then furthermore, as we increase our energy productivity and accessibility, we would be tackling climate action. However, there are obviously major challenges to a lot of things in life, and there are some for ours. So right now would be storm protection due to the fact that, for example, wave piston energy is right on the shoreline where waves crash. And right now they're working on different techniques for durability. So there's just a lot of different energy um, innovations that need to be further completed for that. Grid connection, same thing, the idea of just f connecting it to the grid. I mean, um, right now, like we talked about, Westman Islands, they only have really that one line, and we want to hopefully improve on that. Production transportation deployment. And then, as of right now, we don't really have any environmental impacts, but there are definitely some potential ones. Um, and community outrage, in my opinion, I believe would be one of the highest ones on our list. If we think of the Cape Cod offshore wind farms, right now the main problem with that was simply they did not want their line of view being blocked, they didn't want it being built, and to and possibly these smaller communities just simply will not want their waters to be taken over by these um, different farms, different um, energy techniques. However, one cool thing about wave piston and a lot of these different types of energies is that they are underwater, so you really can't see them, and they're just suspended by a couple buoys, and that's not that bad. Questions? Anyone? Claps. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. Great presentation, congratulations. Um, my first question is, um, I know you guys said that you were looking at a bunch of different places. Uh, are you focusing in the United States or in other countries? And could you give an example of somewhere what you think would be a good fit for your solution? Yeah, so uh, ideally, uh, like poor communities that are in need of or uh, in need of power and uh, are reliant on you know personal generators, like we said, um, probably we'd start in the United States uh, to do like funding and stuff like that. I could think of like Florida as an example is a place with like a high rate of like hurricanes and store and power outages, uh, especially with like uh, the ch climate change uh, affecting that. Uh, the frequency of those issues. So uh, I think maybe like somewhere in the Keys or um, places where uh, they don't have access to the uh, right funding or where people struggle to even like, buy, you know, purchase their own personal generators. Um, I don't know if you guys have any other ideas or examples. I would say then after like moving outwards out of the U.S., focusing more on smaller, smaller islands that where the countries don't necessarily um, dedicate their funding to. For instance, we have the Canary Islands, which a lot of the times are subjected by, again, hurricanes and storms, and a lot of the money allocated for that necessarily doesn't go to that small type of islands, and just, I guess, working our way up in scale to hopefully become more of a global um, situation scale type of thing, yeah.
<coughs> I have a question from Jake. It's how do you plan to effectively engage and involve community members in your project? Okay, maybe I'll start. Um, <laughs> so a lot of people are against like wind farms and stuff like that uh, on their coast. So I, th I could think of a few ways where we could um, get uh, kind of get people to maybe start if they're bothered by the you know, the visual aspect of it, or if they're bothered by the, like the idea of like other kind of invasive, more invasive um, renewable energy sources. Maybe having a campaign to reduce the number of like wind farms on the coast, or um, kind of reduce other you know, renewable energy sources, or not m any other energy sources, uh, so that they, you know, have a better idea of the coastline, as well as not having to, you know, purchase their own personal generators, which can be expensive, and, you know, powering those generators with, you know, diesel fuel can also be expensive, so there are campaigns like that to, you know, kind of reduce the pressure on people in these coastal communities. Yeah, we could also have just, um, like, uh, I guess like workshops with the local, some local community members. And I was reading an article where some people did this in some islands off of Alaska, not related to energy, but was basically just involved them. They went to like a building that had several community members and they were just basically like, how do you want to solve this problem? And it was just like a meeting of like the science scientists as well as like a meeting of just the community members whose homes will be impacted by what decisions we make. Uh, one more thing I could say is like uh, it, we could prov also argue that it's providing a new industry for these poor maybe like agricultural or fishing communities. So um, if they want access to maybe like uh, you know just a new job installing these or you know uh, learning more about them that could be another Great, I have one more question. Um, it's what makes you different than other companies that are already doing the wave energy? Yeah, so uh, we're not really uh, pr like providing, we're, we're not uh, manufacturing wave energy, we're just uh, kind of a information, we're, we're col a data collection organization for the most part. So we're providing these uh, uh, wave, like such as wave piston, uh, we would be providing them with the, the information and maybe helping uh, install the infrastructure or um, getting the word out for these people so that they could get more funding to get this actually, get the ball rolling on this project. I know that wave piston actually doesn't have any, um, they're working on it by, by 2025, they wanna have wave piston installed in some Norwegian countries, uh, but they don't actually have anything implemented at the moment, so we could be a an organization to help them kind of get the ball rolling, and just provide information to where this might be like the optim what the optimal places for these uh, technologies, new technologies to be installed. <laughs> Thank you. So congratulations to all of you guys for completing the Green, green Program. Uh, and thank you for the very innovative ideas and great presentations. You did an amazing job. Uh, I just want to take a minute to thank you guys for putting this together and like putting all of your, all you got into it. You guys did a great job. And I want to encourage you guys to use the things that you learned doing this. Uh, in your future endeavors. If you want to continue with these projects or if you have another entrepreneurial idea that you want to um, want to nurture and, and grow, uh, I highly encourage you guys to use the skills you learned doing this to that. So um, congratulations to everyone and um, woo. <laughs>